Well, good morning. We're here to discuss uh, the results of the late breaking science session uh, in a title uh, presentation on innovative therapies and novel applications. And I'm with uh, Professor Stephanie Dimler, as well as, of course, Professor um, Stevenson from Vanderbilt University. I think we've really had an opportunity to hear a wide range of studies uh, this morning. And perhaps I will start with you, Dr. Stevenson, to tell us a little bit more about uh, the reduced lap HF trial. Well, as you know, um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is really one of the worst problems we have. We have no therapies for this other than just guided diuretic therapy. So this is a very brave new therapy uh, in which they put a device across between the right atrial and left atrial septum to unload the left atrium, particularly during exercise when filling pressures rise and cause symptoms in this group. So it's a fascinating physiology. It's a very innovative um, new therapy. And there is preliminary information that it does what we would like it to do, which is to decrease those filling pressures, particularly during exercise. It's a small trial, 44 patients. And we need to know a lot more about what it does over time. We need to make sure that it doesn't worsen RV function, doesn't worsen renal function, uh, and also we need to understand better which patients we might select for this in terms of how much extra volume they have. Because mm -hmm. we've learned, as you know, recently that the obese heart failure patients have much more tendency to retain volume mm -hmm. than the non-obese heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So this device may work differently. But it's very encouraging, the initial results, and I'm quite happy to see that they already have planned to use these results and tailor them for a bigger trial that should give us a real answer. So your thoughts about what might be the next steps uh, in the area of um, heart failure preserved ejection? Well, we know already that if we monitor the filling pressures and adjust diuretics to treat those filling pressures, that patients do better and stay out of the hospital. So it really helps to focus on the issue of those filling pressures as being central to that disease. Mm -hmm. And this is another way to mm -hmm. approach those that perhaps may work more specifically during exercise, which is many of their symptoms occur. But mm -hmm. we really do need to focus on those filling pressures, how to keep them down, and also mm -hmm. how to preserve right ventricular function. Because the right ventricle is this critical tipping mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. and we're a little concerned with something that increases right-sided load, that we mm -hmm. might put more stress on that vulnerable right ventricle. So we'll have to see in this big trial that they've planned. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the next trial that we heard uh, about this morning is a temporary neurotoxin treatment to prevent uh, post-operative atrial fibrillation uh, from the Duke um, Clinical uh, Research Trial. So this is actually quite interesting. So we know that after uh, an operation, atrial fibrillation is a serious problem. And based on some initial observations, um, these investigators wanted now to follow up to determine whether the injection of, uh, in essence, botulinum toxin, mm -hmm. which is the same thing that's used for Botox, can potentially reduce uh, postoperative uh, atrial fibrillation. Based on inclusion and exclusion criteria, this study had only actually found about 130 patients um, out of a large, which was close to about 6.4% uh, of uh, total patients screened. And in essence, um, they um, had set some particular criteria, as much as a 40% reduction with that intervention, and uh, they had not necessarily been able to um, meet the, um, those uh, predetermined uh, criteria. So while botulinum toxin um, presumably working on the imbalance of the autonomic nervous system uh, is a potential area of uh, involvement. Um, this particular trial didn't necessarily uh, reach um, inferior, you know, superiority. And so perhaps um, one of the uh, important aspects that this trial raises is perhaps we need to do a better job at trying to identify um, what might be um, imbalances of autonomic dysfunction so that we can better be able to identify those patients who are perhaps at higher um, likelihood of, of benefiting from this particular therapy. But nonetheless, interesting and um, much more than waits um, to be discovered uh, in this particular space. Any thoughts from any one of you? Well, I thought it was such an interesting idea to do something 
while you're in the operating room yeah. that would somehow affect this short-term outcome of post-op atrial fibrillation, which mm -hmm. is such a problem. So I thought that itself was mm -hmm. very innovative and interesting. And it could be that you need to combine this with something else, perhaps some anti-inflammatory process. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was very intrigued by the idea, although I agree. It's not something that uh, was quite as positive as we hoped it would be. Correct. Well, the third trial um, presented by Dr. Mary McDermott from Northwestern University was actually now looking at um, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor with or without supervised exercise to improve walking performance in peripheral artery disease. The Propel randomized trial. And maybe, um, Dr. Dimler, you might want to comment on what you thought uh, uh, about the results of this trial. So in this trial, they tested the effect of a cytokine, namely GMCSF, which was uh, shown to mobilize so-called endothelial progenitor cells, or at least pro-antigenic and reparative cells, with or without exercise. And actually, what this trial shows is that exercise alone, or in combination with the cytokine, is uh, improving six-minute walk distance, while the GCSF alone, the GMCSF alone, didn't have any effect. So this suggests that exercise is sufficient to have beneficial effects on six-minute walk distance. Um, on, on the other hand, this endpoint was very positive, and I think this is very encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the perfusion measuring didn't show so much benefit, so it looks like more that exercise is enhancing the capacity to mm -hmm. walk, which of course is very important for daily life, yeah. but had no really functional effects on repairing the vessels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is really um, quite, uh, well, maybe, then did you want to? I love this trial. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I think it's great when we yeah. can demonstrate that the patient can do something that yeah. makes themselves better, yeah. better than what we can do for them. And mm -hmm. this is a message we've got to get out to them, is that they can't come to us and say, fix me. We need to say, I can help you fix yourself. Uh, and that, to me, is very exciting that it really underlines that the patient has got to be a major part of their therapy. We're not going to come up with the magic serum that's going to do it for them. Let me pick up on where, you know, just to sort of share what actually caught my eye. So notwithstanding that um, this is a serious and important problem, that exercise can actually show benefit, even without, if you will, um, some magic serum, close to a half of patients are not interested. And yet, another one out of five patients thinks it's an inconvenience. <laughs> so there's so much more <laughs> that we really need to be thinking about um, as we um, treat these patients and really being able to sort of move them to interventions such as exercise for peripheral vascular disease. Well, terrific. Let me now move on next um, to uh, two other trials that are somewhat similar. The first was the All-Star trial. This was a six-month trial using allogeneic heart stem cells to achieve myocardial uh, regeneration, which is a double-blind randomized trial. And the next trial, in fact, that was uh, using similar cells is called the Cardiosphere device cells for the treatment of Duchenne uh, cardiomyopathy, results of the heart cardiomyopathy progression trial. So, um, Lynn, perhaps you may want to just comment on some of the um, Overall highlights, Duchenne mustard disease obviously is an important and significant clinical problem, and maybe some of the highlights, and then we'll get all three of us to maybe uh, compliment. Well, I thought those two trials together were very interesting because the disease is so different. One of them was a post-infarct study of people mm -hmm. who felt pretty well, but it had a heart attack, and the other is Duchenne's the devastating genetic disease associated with peripheral muscle disease and heart muscle disease. And it was very interesting to see the same therapy mm -hmm. tested in both, I yes. thought. Um, the other thing I was really interested in, particularly with the Duchenne's group, is the fact that the peripheral muscle strength seemed to improve after injecting cells into the heart, which reminds us how little we understand about what we do when we give these cells. Mm -hmm. There are distant effects, paracrine effects, effects aside from what we see that we're doing that are very important and it reminds us that there's quite a mystery even in something that we think we know how it works. Excellent. Stephanie, what do you think? So maybe I can comment first on the All-Star trial, which sure. was um, dedicated to use these cardiosphere-derived cells for chronic ischemic mm -hmm. uh, heart failure. Mm -hmm. And actually this group of investigators really 
showed that this novel type of cell, which is allogeneic, so everybody was raising safety concerns because allogeneic cells might induce an immune response, mm -hmm. but this therapy really was safe, so they see mm -hmm. no adverse effect, which I think is very encouraging mm -hmm. also for the allogeneic cell therapy field in general, and of mm -hmm. course allogeneic cells may be easier to, to have, have mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think this was very important. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, of course, they lacked to show effects on their primary endpoint, which was infarct size production. But I think if you look on all the other endpoints, functional endpoints, MR endpoints, volume, anti mm -hmm. bobin P, also the clinical endpoints, all were tend to be or were significantly positive. So mm -hmm. I felt it was very sad that this trial was stopped because they only looked at the SCAR site at an interim analysis. Mm -hmm. So if they would have looked at any of the other parameters, they wouldn't have stopped the trial. They would have maybe more patients included this trial mm -hmm. would still be running and really could test the final hypothesis. So I think mm -hmm. what I learned from this trial is we should be encouraged not looking only one single endpoint in such small trials, but rather have the full picture in mind, mm -hmm. particularly if we think about stopping a trial. Um, I think one needs all the endurance in new fields and, and, and not being too much worried about one primary endpoint in these phase two trials. It's something else than if you have a phase three tri clinical trial. Now, I think one of the things that we all face in this research is we may not be smart enough to always know the right question <laughs> to ask. Yeah. So we have to be open to answers that we didn't expect. On the other hand, I do think we've been discouraged over a sequence of these cell trials in which we never quite made what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. So I'm really hoping we can find something that will get over that bar and uh, uh, kind of make all this enthusiasm pay off. You know, when you sort of just step back and look at areas such as uh, many uh, blood diseases, stem cell therapy actually is standard of care. And so when we're using stem cells, we're the milieu that we're putting these cells, might be your bone marrow, it's actually curative. I think that when we're using stem cells for organs other than the bone marrow, that's really when, um, at least for the last uh, 10, 15 years, in spite of a substantial number of efforts and uh, many ways in which we're trying to modify, somehow we quite don't um, understand how to really be able to um, have cells that will actually go to particular organs, be it the muscle in the heart or muscle in the skeletal, to, uh, skeletal muscle, and actually see that particular improvements. This particular trial um, was actually based on the idea that maybe the cells release certain factors that are contained in, in, in these specialized uh, vesicles that are called exosomes. And uh, perhaps these exosomes will go to their particular sites, the distant sites, as you mentioned, Lynn, and potentially be able to uh, uh, affect um, their outcomes. I think the bottom line is that we still need more to do. Um, this is an important area. Uh, there are many patients who can benefit from some form of therapy, and I think it um, really underscores that uh, many of these patients who are actually choosing to enroll are really the real uh, heroes. And, and notwithstanding, uh, this is why we come to scientific sessions, to also get uh, smart, bright people to be able to tackle these intractable problems. One other thing that relates to that is that in several of these trials, part of why it didn't quite make the bar is because the therapy in the control arm was so good. And one of the encouraging things, particularly in the all-star trial, is how well the control patients did after their myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. So all of the other improvements that we're making are basically making their way into practice and into the results. So we should also feel very good about the fact that the, the overall bar is rising because of successes. Terrific. Well, let me just say that uh, I wish to thank both uh, Lynn and Stephanie for joining me in uh, this recap of uh, much of the innovative studies that we've been able to review uh, this morning, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at Scientific Sessions 2018. Thank you.